So CAF works extensively as a soil scientist, educator and facilitator with rural and regional communities. Um, she has been a lecturer in soil science for Melbourne Uni at, at Dukie and worked for the Department of Agriculture and Extension programs focused around soil health. Uh, Kath holds a Bachelor and Masters of Science in Agriculture and a Graduate Certificate in Soil Conservation. She is accredited by Soil Science Australia as a Certified Professional Soil Scientist. She also holds a Certificate for in Training and Assessment. Uh, Kath lives in Benalla and now works as a consultant. Um, Kath, together with um, Yay River Catchment Land Care Group, Judy Brooks, um, published the small reference book that you have hopefully in your hot little hand, uh, Soil Test Interpretation Step by Step. I'll be in massive trouble because I just got the name of that wrong. <laughs> the, word, the words are all there. Um, so it's a hard copy booklet. Uh, hopefully you've got one. If you don't, I can get one too, but it's Thank also available well, online. Um, and I'm it's going QGIS and print out the soil test results off there. So it's, um, the booklet is specifically designed to demystify the complexity of soil tests um, and to support key farm decisions. So, um, and we've had some really good um, feedback from that. So it's great that um, people are, that you guys are reading it and using it alongside these workshops. Um, the, the booklet was a collaborative project between the Yay River Catchment, uh, Judy Brooks, as I said, a local editor and the Golden Broken CMA and the books have been posted uh, all around the country. So thank you everyone for joining us and Kath, I'll hand over to you now. Fantastic. Thank you, Rhiannon, and um, thanks for having me. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see that, Rhiannon? Yes, yep, that's great. Fantastic. All right. Yeah, well, great to um, have you all on board and um, um, yeah, really great to work with you. And um, thanks again to the CMA for sponsoring uh, the workshops. And again, um, heartfelt thanks to uh, Judy, who, as Rhiannon has said, has been a driving force behind both these presentations, but also behind uh, the booklet. Uh, so today, uh, what I want to go through is um, some of the soil tests that you'll see on your soil test results and just help you understand how to read them, how to make sense of them and some of the critical limits that you might need to be thinking about. I'm not necessarily, uh, the objectives are not necessarily to make you a, a expert, but potentially to arm you with some questions um, that you can then discuss with your advisor. So it's really just to try and help you get on a more even footing with your advisor so you can have a really good productive um, conversation with them about your soil test results and what the next steps uh, might be. Um, so in terms of uh, the messages uh, for today and, and for session one, uh, the, the key message here is that uh, soil tests are only one piece of the puzzle and not 100% of the story. So the other pieces are really about uh, you and your goals, what you're aiming to achieve, and also about the current paddock condition and the soil type. They're all critical components to that discussion that you have with your advisor. So just getting a number on the page is not uh, the be all and end all. It, it, it helps with the discussion, but certainly your perspective is going to be really important in that discussion. So really encouraging you to make sure that um, your thoughts are at the table as well. That being said, I think soil testing is a very important tool for managing soil health and having a more regular sampling regime is what's going to really um, help you in getting greater understanding and more confidence in the whole process, but also in your management. 
So a one-off soil test. So for those of you that are joining us that have only just got your soil test and you've never done one before, it is going to be a little bit harder to really interpret what's going on from a one-off soil test. But as you add to that test in, in three, four, five years time, you take another test, then you're in a lot better position to really see what the trends are and allow some comparisons and um, get a lot more confidence in what you're doing. Uh, in session one, we sort of we finished um, with this some of these uh, first few slides that I just want to show because I think it, I think there's a few uh, people joining us today that didn't come to session one. And I also just wanted to remind those that were with us just about some of these important terms and concepts that you see on soil tests. So you might see these terms available, you might see extractable, you might see total, and you might see exchangeable. And I think it's important for us to uh, get our head around that. And to do that, I'm just going to put up this diagram which um, comes from a, a very um, well known uh, book, uh, the Soil Analysis and Interpretation Manual that was published by CSIRO. Uh, and this uh, diagram is giving us a really good picture of what's going on in the soil when you come along and take your soil test. And the idea here is just to show you some of the complexity of nutrient pathways um, that is happening and you come along and take a one-off soil test. So you can sort of see that nutrients can exist in various pools within the soil. And um, so interpreting that can be a little bit tricky um, with your soil test. So just let's just go through it. We've got the soil solution pool. So that's the the nutrients that are available for plant uptake and the plant roots um, take up those nutrients um, easily. Feeding into that soil solution pool, we've got um, nutrients that are tied up in the mineral phase. They're in the in crystalline form in minerals or they're sitting on the surfaces as, a, as an exchangeable pool. And they become available through ads, through desorption processes where they're um, taken off the surface of the mineral and become available in the soil solution. At the same time, we have uh, nutrients that are existing in the organic pool. Um, so in all the organic matter, and they become available through the actions of microbes and through the processes of mineralization they become available into the soil solution uh, in the soil solution pool for plant root uptake. Um, some nutrients like nitrogen also have a gaseous uh, phase and, and so on. So nutrients are being taken out of that soil solution pool and being added into by a whole range of processes. Today we're going to talk about nutrients like phosphorus and phosphorus exists both in the mineral phase and the organic phase. And what that means is that the availability of phosphorus in your soil is going to be governed by both biological processes and by mineral processes, this desorption and adsorption process. We're also going to talk about things like nitrogen. And nitrogen exists almost entirely in the organic phase. So it is dominated by biological processes to make that nitrogen available. So things like um, soil moisture, soil temperature um, are all going to affect um, uh, the availability of nitrogen. Uh, we're going to talk about things like potassium. And potassium exists almost entirely or only entirely in the mineral phase. So it's not tied up in biological processes, but it is entirely dependent then on uh, mineral chemical processes to make it available. So I just wanted to uh, recap on that and just show how um, the complexity of what we're trying to get our head around today. 
All right. Um, I'm going to start with a test. So get ready with your chat box. Uh, we've got a soil. Uh, it's growing pasture. We've got a sample depth of 10 centimetres and we've got a phosphorus result of 12 milligrams per kilogram. So I'm just interested uh, to hear from you in the chat box. Type in whether you think that result um, is high, low, medium. What would you say about that result? So type that in. And Brianna, and I might ask you to uh, read out some of our responses there. Yeah, because you can't see the chat box, can you? Can? Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, Alice has asked Colwell or Olsen. Oh, uh, good Mark question. Has said, Mark has said low. Michelle saying mid range. Judy, lower level of ideal, 12 to 15. We have a mid. All right. Well, I'm going to give full marks to Alice because um, it really depends on the test that was used. And with phosphorus, there is a whole range of tests um, that we could be using. And therefore, our interpretation will depend on the test. So these are tests that um, soil chemists have, a, have come up with uh, as a way of extracting um, the nutrient and then we've got to work out how to interpret that result. So one of the things I'm going to do as we go through is always talk to you about the test that was used and it's really important that whoever you're sending your soil sample to, you need to know what test are they using. And that was something we talked about uh, in our first uh, session, um, understanding the test being used and uh, is that laboratory accredited to use that test. All right, so I wanted to start uh, with the sort of big issues for soil health. Um, and so the first part of my presentation, we're going to deal with uh, organic matter uh, pH and phosphorus is the big, uh, the big three. So first of all, let's have a look at organic matter. So you're on page 18 of the uh, little booklet if you'd like to have a look at that page. So traditionally we've used the Wakely Black um, method. Um, there are some new methods um, coming through uh, that you know, uh, are sort of modernising how we measure uh, organic carbon. The reason why I think it's a big one for us to consider is that organic matter really helps um, us to understand overall soil fertility and also soil structure. So it's very important. So what is organic matter? It's everything that is in or on the soil that is of biological origin. So it's all the things that are dead, all the things that are decomposing, all the things that are alive in soil. So it does include plant roots. It's a very diverse collection of materials. It includes all of our microbes, earthworms, uh, as well as decomposing, decomposting, uh, plant material, manure, all of those things are part of organic matter. And organic matter is very important. Um, this slide has come from Jeff Baldock from CSIRO, who's been leading our national soil carbon uh, research program. And I think this is a great slide because it really does sum up uh, why organic matter is important. Organic matter uh, really influences the soil uh, physical uh, properties in that organic matter really improves soil structure. It really helps to uh, improve water retention and 
uh, it really helps to keep soil temperature um, at an, on an even keel as we go through summer and winter. So those of you with gardens will know this time of year you're all mulching like mad and that's because you know by putting organic matter on the surface you help to retain the soil moisture and the soil feels cool even in the really heat of summer. Uh, organic matter also influences the chemical properties of the soil. Uh, it helps to improve cation exchange capacities in soils that are quite uh, sandy and cation exchange capacity is something that we'll discuss further in, our, uh, in the session on Thursday. It can also help to buffer against pH uh, change, so further acidification, and it can also be uh, a useful thing for soils that have contaminants in them because it can help to complex out those contaminants and make them less available. And the third reason why soil organic matter is important is because uh, it greatly influences biological processes and biological properties. Uh, so it really provides the energy for the uh, microbes that are living in soil. It is a, a, an absolutely amazing reservoir of nutrients. And because of all of what it does, it really contributes to resilience, the overall resilience of your soil to um, extremes in climate. So looking at your soil test then, um, you'll see uh, a reference to soil organic carbon um, uh, expressed as a percentage. Um, organic matter is difficult for laboratories to measure. So as we said before, it, it has a lot of uh, a very diverse range of materials. The one thing that all those materials have in common is carbon. And so in the laboratory, they measure carbon. Uh, and it can then be converted to organic matter uh, levels. So here we've got organic carbon levels, um, target sort of ranges for low rainfall, high rainfall. I guess in terms of rainfall, I'm I'm probably thinking around the 600 mil uh, per year would be where we might put the dividing line in there somewhere. So those of you that are on less than 600, you're in the low rainfall category and those that are in high rainfall uh, above 600 you'd be in the high rainfall category. Suffice to say what we really want is to be above 2%. Um, so soils with less than 2% are often soils that are being cropped um, continuously and some work that was done by Judy Tisdall um, at Tatura quite a few years ago, really established um, that 2%, as soils go below 2% organic carbon, they will have a lot of trouble trying to aggregate or keep aggregated. And that's where then a lot of soil structural issues, um, we have a lot of problems with hard setting and crusting because our organic carbon levels are too low for the soil to actually form that crumb structure. So over to you. Um, can you type in the chat box um, your organic carbon levels from your result? And I'll get um, Rhiannon to read some of those out. 6.8. Mm. Four point seven. 6, 7, 4.8, 5.4, 3.4 to 3.8, 6, mm -hmm. 4.86, 2.5, 1.8, 3.8, 3.5 to 5. Um, in 600ml rainfall, 30cm sample, 1.6. Mm. John, 4.9, uh, 3.7, 3.6. 
We've got lowest at 2.6, highest at 8.69. Fantastic. Thanks, Rhiannon. So, you know, there's obviously some really good um, results there, and they're also some are on the lower end of the scale. So I guess the uh, automatic question then is, well, what determines the organic matter content of my soil? So there are a couple of things that are strong determinants of how much organic matter you will have. Some of them are related to the soil characteristics. Some of them are related to climate, as in where you are located. And some of them are also related to land use and farm practices. In terms of soil characteristics, um, clay content is a big one. So we do tend to find higher levels of carbon in clay soils and lower levels of carbon in sandy soils. Uh, so in clay, clay has this ability to bind with organic matter, so it, it chemically forms bonds and then um, once the soil then crumbs up and becomes like an aggregate, you then get organic matter that it is well hidden from biology in terms of that would like to break it down. So you get this higher level of organic matter both because it's bonded to the clay, but also because it's then hidden within the aggregates. Uh, in terms of climate, we've sort of I've touched on the fact that rainfall is a big driver. So uh, as you can appreciate, if we go further west um, and up into some desert country where it's very uh, dry, you're not going to see a lot of organic matter in soil. Um, so rainfall is a big driver and that's because with higher levels of rainfall, we get a lot of growth um, from the soil and then uh, that all then becomes available for decomposition into the soil. But where we've got lower levels of rainfall, we've got lower levels of growth on the soil and so less amount of organic material going into the soil. Um, and then we've also got things like land use and farm practices. So certainly croppers, um, those of you that have done a bit of cropping will tend to find that your organic carbon levels on those paddocks will be lower, slightly lower than paddocks that are in permanent pasture. Uh, species choice, so certainly grassy pastures will have higher levels of organic matter than those pastures that don't have much grass in them. Uh, so they're all important uh, determinants of organic matter. So if you've got low levels, uh, most of you seem to have quite good levels, but if you wanted to increase, um, how do you do it? Um, you can add it in, you can grow it, um, and you can certainly manage to try and keep it. So by adding it, you can apply inputs of organic matter like manures and composts, biochars, biosolids, all those things contain a lot of high levels of organic matter. And by putting them on the soil, you're adding organic uh, inputs. But for those of you that um, went and took the opportunity to have a look at some of those uh, animations, I hope you know one of the things you might have taken away from looking at the animation on soil organic carbon is that when you put more organic matter on, then the organisms that are in the soil begin to break that organic matter down and release most of it, um, 80 to 90 percent of it is lost as carbon dioxide in that in that process of decomposition. So you can't then just add it and think, right, that's it, I've done it. Much the same as in your garden, where you will be continually adding manures and composts in, in the same way on the farm you have to continue to add it if you want to maintain it at a higher level. One of the other things you can do is grow it, um, which is probably the cheaper way of doing it, and that is be really focused on growing more biomass. So it could be through green manure crops, 
certainly through growing grasses. So grasses have this um, uh, ratio between their roots and their shoots that means they grow a lot of roots, uh, particularly the fine rooting uh, species like ryegrass and so on, have, grow a lot of root mass. And as that root mass dies off, then all of that is then added into uh, the organic uh, material. So um, including grasses in your pastures is a key way of managing to increase soil organic carbon. And through rotational grazing, which really works hand in hand with having a good grassy pasture, with the rotational grazing, you allow your uh, pastures to rest after a grazing period, which enables them to grow back. And as they grow more shoot, they're certainly growing more root. So more roots then become um, available to, or, or are added into this organic pool. Um, and keep it. So certainly by keeping it, managing your grazing to maintain ground cover, particularly in summer, to reduce the potential of erosion losses by wind and water. So one of the things we know about organic matter um, from a previous slide you would have seen is that it's really concentrated up in the top uh, surface um, layers of the soil. Uh, it does go down into subsoil through the action of roots and so on, but it is concentrated in the top. And it's the top soil that is most vulnerable to wind and water erosion. And so we can certainly see great losses of organic material every time you allow that soil to be bared off through grazing and we then get wind and water erosion washing that away. So questions. Um, one of the questions that came through um, Rhiannon was just the terms, so soil organic uh, content and soil carbon. So just wanted to quickly run through that. Um, total carbon is the sum of the three of, of carbon forms, the organic carbon, the elemental carbon, so that is carbon in um, um, it, it's not really a significant component and the inorganic, which is present in carbonates, bicarbonates um, and so on. So the total carbon um, is referring to a whole lot of things that have carbon that are in the soil, not just the organic form. So that's why we see specifically total organic carbon or soil organic carbon uh, to refer to those things that are coming from the organic matter. All right, um, are there some other questions in the chat box about soil carbon? There are, Kath, and this one's about soil carbon and sampling depth. So Kerry had asked, um, how does the sample depth, depth change the result? So 10 centimetres versus 30 centimetres. Uh, and also noted that her soil carbon, organic carbon was 1.6 for a 30 centimetre sample, which uh, just relates back to what you were saying about the topsoil and the subsoil. Mm. So yes, certainly, um, you know, that's where using the standard sampling depth will help you interpret the soil test result. So standard sampling depth is 0 to 10, and that's what all the critical um, levels for interpreting your soil tests are based on. So certainly by sampling deeper, we know that as you go deeper, there is less and less organic carbon. And so with that 1.6 that you've um, you've got that result will be because the organic carbon that was in your soil has been diluted out by the deeper um, sampling depth that you took. I hope that makes sense. Does that make sense, Rhiannon? 
Uh, yes, and so that would apply for other elements in the soil, would it? Uh, certainly, yes, yeah, certainly. All, all of the interpretation um, material that we'll be looking at is all based on a standard 0 to 10 centimetre soil sample which is yep. what we talked about in session one, why it is so important um, to sample at that depth. Yep. Uh, depth will also maybe become important for soil acidity uh, when we get to that. Um, Definitely. I probably should just say one other thing, Rhiannon, about that um, not to 30 centimetre sampling depth because when it comes to um, carbon accounting and looking at um, carbon sequestration in soils, then yes, they do sample down to 30 centimetres. Um, so it depends on um, what you're sampling for, the purpose, and I guess I'm doing my interpretation here based on we're sampling for management to inform our management decisions. Whereas um, sampling for ca carbon accounting and carbon sequestration in soils is going down to 30 centimetres and it's a different type of sampling um, because they also take bulk density and they do some calculations so that the carbon is not expressed as a percentage but it's expressed as um, a weight. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thanks Kath. I've got two more questions. Um, there were some uh, notes when people were putting in their soil organic carbon percentages that their soil, their laboratory has put an interpretation or a recommendation around desired levels. Um, so one was uh, for 0.7 to 1.4 was the desirable level for Walkley Black. Um, and also there was another one, one and a half to two percent. Um, yeah, so mm. is there a reason why labs are putting different ranges to what you've said? Yeah, I find that surprising. They're very low levels that they're saying are desirable. Yeah. Uh, I can't I can't really answer that question. Um yeah. well just just further to that, the question uh the plot thickens. Um Judy was saying that um, so APAL's desired level is somewhere around 0.7 and 1.4, but it seems to change with many of the soil tests taken. Is it maybe because of different soil types? Um, why is it so low? Um, 2.64 is shown as high, almost excessive. So um, that maybe doesn't add um, change your answer. Yeah, I don't. I don't know why. That seems very low to me. If you have that sort of anomaly or query after today, is it worth ringing the laboratory and asking them about some of those interpretations or levels? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a good question to be asking. If it's your, if it's the advisor who said, I want you to go with APAL, then I'll, I'd be talking to your advisor about what, yeah, why why have they got such a different way of interpreting it? So there may, there may be a very fine reason, but I don't know it. Yeah, okay. Mm. Um, and Charlie, the last question was, um, or Charlie was wondering if understocking or a low stocking rate would therefore improve carbon matter and carbon, organic matter and soil organic carbon. Yeah, interesting question. Um, my gut feel, Charlie, would be that it's it's more about the rest period in a rotational grazing setup. If we're just reducing stock numbers but keeping them set stocked, then I suspect that you will still get preferential grazing, which is going to graze out uh, your grasses and it's really the grasses that add to the organic matter that they're, they're the, the key driver for adding organic matter into soil 
So if stock are still set stocked and they're allowed to pick and choose what they will eat and what they won't eat, then I suspect that over time your prefer preferable grasses will be grazed out and you'll be left with more weeds which tend not to add as much organic matter um, in the soil. They tend to be more taprooted um, and therefore don't have the fine roots that add to organic matter. Thanks, Kath. But that's just my thought. I'm, I'm not basing that on any um, scientific um, yep. understanding that I have. Yeah. And I just um, would like to acknowledge that it's a right, it's a, it's a, this um, online webinar format is a challenging way to sort of deal with some of these questions in this discussion because um, Kath can't see the chat box um, and you guys um, don't have a voice. You're having to type your questions and stuff. So <laughs> ordinarily we'd be in the room and, and having a, a maybe a more wholesome um conversation so yeah so yeah. thanks everyone for, for bearing with us um so that's that's all for the questions thanks Kath great thanks Rhiannon so let's move on to um pH so you're looking now at page 13 of the booklet um so first of all um what is pH um so pH is a measure of the hydrogen ion concentration in the in the soil. Uh, the pH scale is logarithmic and what that means is that the difference in the numbers on the scale is 10 times. So for example uh, if we were comparing a soil with a pH of 5 and a pH, a so another soil with a pH of 4 the soil with pH of 4 is 10 times more acidic than a pH of 5. So I think that's um, a really important aspect with pH to get your head around because a 10 times uh, change in concentration is pretty big. Uh, and I think the different the scale can sometimes hide that so we sort of think well there's not much difference between a pH of 4 and a pH of 5 that that can't be much difference but it's a it's a big difference when you come to soil chemistry or any sort of chemistry when you're changing the concentration of something by tenfold it does a lot to change the chemical processes that occur in soil so the neutral right, uh, is seven um, and the critical limits uh, depends on the method that we're using. So we have um, two main methods and you'll see both of these reported on your soil test. There'll be a pH in a one to five soil to water and a pH in a one to five soil to 0.01 molar calcium chloride. So this means they take one part soil and then they add five parts of water or in the other case they add five parts of a 0.01 molar calcium chloride solution. The pH in water is the older method, the pH in calcium chloride is the newer method. Um, the pH in calcium chloride came about because it is less affected by seasonal variation. So in the pH in water, you will get quite a bit of variation in from season to season. So if you haven't sampled at the same time of year or the season has been quite different, uh, you will um, see a difference in your pH when maybe there's not a, a difference in your pH. So the pH in calcium chloride is probably better for monitoring over time. Uh, in terms of um, critical limits uh, in pH measured in water, uh, we're wanting to keep our pH above 5.5 and in calcium chloride, we're wanting to keep our pH above 4.8. So the pH in calcium chloride is generally always lower than your pH in water. 
So I'd be really keen to hear what pH ranges we have. So if you want to type in your pH in the calcium chloride measure. So type in the pH of your calcium chloride measure. And let's have a look at what you've got. Uh, 5, 5.06, 5.1, 4.2, 4.6, 4.7, 4.1 to 4.9, 5.1, 4.5, 3.9, 4.2 to 5.6, 4.6, 6.5 in water, uh, 4.93, 4.3 to 5.1, 4.4 to 5.6, 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 4.4 to
So for those of you that have got some um, acidic pHs and um, there were some there that I heard being read out, 3.9, 4.2, 4.3. Um, so pHs that are well below that 4.8 critical limit, um, what can you do about it? Well, you can certainly add uh, lime. Uh, so lime is calcium carbonate. And when you add um, carbonate to acid, um, you get a reaction. So you can do that easily in the kitchen, get your bicarb out and add a bit of uh, vinegar and you'll see the reaction. So that's exactly what lime is doing on your acidic soil. So you can put lime on and for that I'm suggesting that you might uh, particularly target your most productive land um, rather than that land that um, you know might be have a few other production issues. You could grow acid tolerant species uh, and you would also need to consider management of nitrogen to reduce leaching, uh, monitoring your pH and certainly including perennial pastures to reduce your further, uh, further acidification rate. So I just want to go through some of those things with you. So this is um, some work that was done up around Wagga um, and what they were looking at was lime and pasture growth rate responses. Um, and so what we're seeing here is pasture growth rate on the Y axis and then along the X axis we've got uh, the different um, seasons. So let's just go through this. Um, the open bars here are perennial pastures. The solid bars here are limed perennial pastures. The grey bars here are unlimed annual pastures. And the hash bars here, oops, are uh, limed um, annual pasture. These little stars here indicate um, statistically how different the results are. So um, these ones with two stars above them are indicating that these are significantly different, quite significantly different. With one star, it's a little bit marginally significantly different, um, but here again, very significantly different. So we're seeing um, some responses in winter, particularly in perennial grasses, and some strong responses in both uh, perennial and annual uh, in spring. So certainly by adding lime onto pasture, uh, we do get a response. Which brings me to some of the questions that were put through um, at the time of registering. Uh, does the benefits outweigh the cost in terms of liming? Um, do I need to use tillage to incorporate lime into my soil? Are we going to have to lime our acidic country forever? And how to calculate volumes of lime? So I just want to quickly run through these questions and then we'll open it up for, for more. So does the benefit outweigh the costs of lime? So I just want to go back to um, this experiment and I've got some more of their findings here. So what they found was that lime pastures were producing around 18% 18 more pasture dry matter and that did increase the stock carrying capacity. In both cases, it was through a com combination of increased pasture production and improved pasture feed quality. So that what they were finding was they were getting more pasture, but they were getting better pasture. So there was less weed species um, in the pasture mix. The economic analysis um, has confirmed that profit um, from liming can cover the lime expense in the long term. So that's the key 
here um, that you are, uh, are not advised to be expecting an economic response um, in the first year, but as time goes on, you will see more significant uh, economic responses from the application of Lyme. So they were seeing responses to Lyme both in Lyme weight of um, lambs and also in wool production. Top dress or incorporate. So I've pulled out some uh, lessons from the Southern Farming Systems trials and these certainly confirm some of what um, I have found up here in, in the Golden Broken CMA area as well. What they found was that top dressing lime can change pH down to around five to seven and a half centimetres in the first six months. Um, and that certainly confirms what I was finding in some of the experiments that I did around Burriman um, up here, but also there's been lime trials all over the place. You do get a pH change quite quickly uh, in the topsoil. After six months, um, the pH change and the movement of the lime begins to slow down. So incorporation of lime can change the pH at depth more quickly, um, but that is a great expense. So you would be thinking about potentially incorporating lime if you are about to sow a pasture or renovate a pasture that would be a good opportunity to put, uh, to incorporate lime. Otherwise, it's down to top dressing. And with top dressing, uh, you need to really graze off hard so that you've got the least amount of leaf matter on the surface, then add your lime. And uh, if you can time it all so that there's a good drop of rain afterwards, all the, all the better. How much to apply? Well, that's, um, I think, a few years ago, um, I was involved in <laughs> workshops that went for, for two hours just on this question. So I'm, I'm not going to go too much into it, but we'll be referring you down the bottom there to um, some notes that were prepared by Cam Nicholson, which look really good to me, titled Calculating Fertiliser Lime and Gypsum Rates from Soil Testing. So that would be certainly something I'd refer you to. Uh, but how much to apply? The answer is uh, it depends. It depends on the type of lime you apply. So there are a range in types available. Um, remember we talked about it's the carbonate that is the active ingredient. So it depends on um, how much carbonate is in the soil that is in the lime that you're purchasing. So lime is a natural product. There'll be a whole lot of things in there. What you're looking for is higher amounts of carbonate. What you can look out for and you can ask when you're buying the lime is its neutralising ability, NV result, or its effective neutralising value, ENV. Um, so that is looking at the amount of carbonate that is in the lime. So that's a question you can ask. It also depends on fineness. So the finer the lime, the quicker it will act and moisture content. So remembering it's a natural product, but will vary in moisture content. Those limes with higher moisture uh, content um, are costing more to transport. So you just need to remember you are buying possibly a lot of water uh, in some limes. And then you might also do some consideration of the cost to spread it, um, dollars per tonne. So there's some things to think about. There's some things to talk to your advisor um, about when you're selecting lime and deciding how much lime to apply. It does depend a lot on your starting pH and the pH that you want to get it to. Are we going to have to lime our acidic country forever? Um, I guess the answer is um, probably. 
So soils under agricultural systems will continue to acidify. The two biggest contributors to acidification are from nitrate leaching and by shifting your farm produce off the farm. So the very act of agriculture, of taking produce off, taking it to market, you take alkalinity with it. And there's the, the whole nitrate um, leaching story, which we'll come to when we talk about nitrogen um, in a few slides to come. But what nitrate uh, leaching does um, is that it takes with it our alkaline cations and leaves behind the acidic cations. So over time, your system becomes more uh, acidic. So really working on ensuring your farming system is not leaky. Um, so that's where perennial pastures can play a real role for you because they are deep rooted and uh, remain um, living right through summer even though it's really hot. So when the first lot of rains come in autumn and you get quite a flush of nitrate um, becoming available in soil, those plants are ready and able to pick most of that nitrate up. And I'll come back to that point a bit later. All right, so that's um, pH, uh, Rhiannon. So uh, if people would like to type any questions that they have about um, pH, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, just while people are thinking on that, um, there's a couple uh, already. Um, so if plant growth is best with a pH around 6 to 7, why is 4.8 considered the lower limit for ideal pH in calcium chloride? Uh, because it all is dependent on that very important aluminium issue. So that's what we're trying to, um, we're, we're, by keeping our soil pH above 4.8, then you are keeping aluminium at bay. So you're stopping that from affecting your plant growth. Mm. Uh, so, you sorry. sorry. You go. You go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was going to say, but we're not necessarily, if we've got really highly acidic soils and we're working hard and making decisions to get it to 4.8 or above, we're not necessarily working to 6. Uh, for example, because uh, those toxic, um, the the desirable nutrients are available in adequate amounts um, and their toxic ones are not, we're keeping those at bay and the cost of getting it up is, is just going to, to be, I guess, prohibitive and stop you doing other things. That's right. It's a real balancing act, Rhiannon, with the cost. Um, now, I know I've, I've been in sessions before where people have decided that they want to become truffle farmers. Um, and for that to happen, um, truffles are quite uh, sensitive to pH and they've had to grow their oak trees and then put loads and loads of lime on. So it does depend a little bit on what you want to grow as well and how sensitive it is. Um, so things like lucerne are quite sensitive to pH and aluminium, um, which is why checking your pH is really uh, important. But I guess for my perspective would be if you've got a very acidic soil, then I think liming it to 4.8 and then maybe um, you have to think of a, a different dream than um, truffle farming. <laughs> It's interesting, interesting you say that, Kath. Um, we have another question about um, the best time to add lime. So you mentioned that to have the pastures grazed right down and hopefully some rain um, forthcoming. So is that why people often put lime out in autumn? I'm preempting I would, the rest. <laughs> yeah, I would, think, I would think so. Yeah, it makes sense to me. Mm. Yeah, but those are the key factors. Um, the best time to add it is when you've got the grass eaten down um, and then hopefully there's some some uh, rain on the way just to keep it 
keep it in place and not not blow away i suppose um yeah that's right if you if you don't graze it down then the the risk you're running is that the lime catches in the leaves and then you put your stock on and the stock have a great time munching on it and so not as much of it is going to end up in the soil that's all yep okay uh, do you have thoughts on liquid lime I haven't had much experience with liquid lime, to be honest, um, and I guess it all depends on your preferences and the the cost of it. But I don't I don't really have a a, a thought on whether it's um, good or bad or or whatever. Um, any liming material will be useful, so um, it all depends on your preference uh, as to whether you want to do liquid lime. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Robert has asked about his um, pH is 4.2 in calcium chloride. Mm. Uh, his aluminium, his KCL aluminium is 0.23. Does he need to use lime in pasture? Robert, do you have, do we need to know the percentage of aluminium there, Kath, to know whether it aluminium's a problem? It would help me um, in quickly doing the reference if he could type in uh, exchangeable aluminium percentage as a percentage. 7.1%. Yeah, so um, it is above what we would consider a critical limit, which is 5%. So I think the fact of the low pH combined uh, with a higher um, aluminium, it, it's pointing towards the fact that you'll you'll possibly need lime, but but I think it also depends on um, again going back to your goals and the paddock condition as well. You know, if we're talking about um, really steep rocky country um, that that has native pastures on it, native pastures are quite tolerant of the acid soil condition. Um, maybe lime then is not worthwhile considering. Uh, but if it's one of your better paddocks um, with not very many other issues, you know, it's on it's on the flats, it's generally a good producer, then I, I would think putting some lime on uh, would be a good thing to do. Thanks, Kath. Um, we have a last question on pH. Uh, Kerry has a pH of 7.94 in water mm -hmm. uh, he's, and he's wondering if you can speak to um, issues with higher pH. So what was it? 7.94 in water. Yeah. Um, six. Um, look, uh, as you flip into the alkaline range, uh, you can get to have issues with um, boron uh, toxicity, um, but not generally until you get to a pH of say 8.5. So she's still got a way to go. I, I would think in that seven range, she's still fine for most things. I don't, I don't think there will be a problem. But yes, as you go above 8, 8.5, then you can get into a range of other issues such as boron um, toxicity. You can also get zinc deficiency and a few things like that. So yeah, they just have a different set of challenges. So we'll go now to uh, phosphorus, <clears throat> referring to page uh, 22 of your booklet. Um, so phosphorus is one of your key nutrients. It is one of the key macronutrients, really important for early plant growth, uh, root growth and so on. So it's a really key one that we've got to think about. Uh, the availability of phosphorus in the soil is controlled through chemical processes because there's a fair amount of phosphorus that is uh, held in the mineral pool 
uh, and also by soil biological processes because there's a fair bit of phosphorus that's held in soil organic matter. So it's one of these nutrients that um, has two sets of processes going uh, for its availability. Um, so extractable phosphorus, the main methods we talk about are Olsen P, which has been um, a lot of field work uh, has been done, uh, particularly in pasture situations in Victoria. So it's probably the most relevant uh, of the methods that we use and Colwell, which is probably used more broadly in other states. Um, and probably more commonly used in crop situations. Um, I've been noticing on a number of soil tests now, they often are reporting both. The reason for that is that interestingly, both Olsen and Colwell use the same extractant. It's a sodium bicarbonate solution. And the difference between the two uh, tests is just the length of time the soil is shaken with the extractant. So Colwell is shaken for a lot longer than the Olsen P. So generally your Colwell P uh, is higher than your Olsen P. Um, and I was asked about how do you convert between methods. Um, I wouldn't be encouraging you to do that. It's that's a bit unpredictable um, to, to do those conversions. There are other tests available, probably less relevant for us here in Victoria because we just don't have the uh, pasture trials that have that help to back up our interpretation. There was one specific question on Merlick 3. Um, this is a multi-element extractant, so I guess it is one of the reasons why laboratories might like it because they just use the same extractant and are then able to extract out all the other nutrients that you might want to know about. It's used a lot more widely in USA. Uh, there was some assessment done from what I can, what I've found uh, in WA. Um, and that was this published paper here in the Australian Journal of Soil Research back in 2003. And what they found was that the Merlick 3 values were closely correlated to Colwell va uh, values. I'm also a little bit aware, I think, that Merlick 3 has started to become more popular in Tasmania. But anyway, there's some thoughts on different methods. I'm going to focus on Olsen and Colwell because uh, they're the ones that we have most of the field data for here in Victoria. So looking at your Olsen values, if that's on your soil test, uh, referring to page 24. So what's the target? What are, we, what are we trying to target? Well, for native pastures, we know that native pastures are well adapted to low phosphorus situations. Most of our, our soils here in Australia are low in phosphorus compared to other countries, other Northern Hemisphere countries. Um, in for, so for native pastures, it's possibly not as much of an issue. The Evergraze program did have a look at applying phosphorus to native pastures and, and they found there was some production benefits to that application. Uh, but you just need to have your grazing management well in, you know, be well uh, versed in grazing management because it can also encourage uh, more weeds in your pastures. For introduced species, it really depends on your goals and what you're aiming for. So if you're really aiming for high um, production, then you are probably more looking for targets of between 15 and 20. Um, and if you're uh, not as, your, your goals are, have a few other things other than um, high production, then you might be uh, at a lower target range. 
So where does all this come from? It comes from some work that was done by Cameron Gooley here in Victoria, having a look at uh, all the pasture trials that had been done on Olsen P and pasture production. Uh, and he graphed it all out for us. Um, so on this Y axis, we've got percentage of maximum pasture yield. What does that mean? It means that all pastures have a uh, maximum yield. If there's nothing wrong with the soil, the climate, it, this is the potential that it can produce. So this is the percentage of that maximum possible yield, biologically possible yield. Um, and then on the, on the X axis, we've got the Olsen P test. So you can see that we get this um, quite interesting shape of the curve here. So as phosphorus is very low um, and as you increase your phosphorus, you get this increase in um, pasture yield being achieved. And what he's saying is around 95% of your maximum yield can be achieved from a Olsen P of around 15. What the economist would say is there's not a lot of point operating up this part of the curve here where you're trying to go for higher because there's likely to be other issues that are impacting on that pasture production than just phosphorus. So by pouring more phosphorus on, you're not necessarily going to get um, this um, bigger amount, but also you can see that you have to do a big jump in Olsen to get a very small rise because of this shape of this curve. Whereas operating down here, um, a small increase in P and you get quite a big jump. Oop, sorry, big jump in in phosphorus in your pasture production. So the economists would be saying this is the part of the curve you want to operate in. But as I said, it all depends on you and your uh, production uh, goals for your for your farm. If we have a look at Colwell, this is on page 24, you'll see uh, a similar split aiming for 80 to 90 percent of potential pasture yield. These are your targets aiming for 90 to 95 percent of potential pasture yield. These are your targets. But we've also added in a PBI category. What's PBI? PBI is the phosphorus buffering index. Um, and this is referring to the fact that phosphorus is strongly absorbed by soil, um, mostly due to iron and aluminium oxides in the soil. And so it can limit what is available to plants. By measuring your phosphorus buffering index, you get a more uh, accurate estimate of the amount of phosphorus that would be required to raise the available amount of phosphorus. So your target levels will increase with increasing PBI. So going back here, we can see that if you have a very low PBI category, that is, you don't, there's not very many iron oxides, aluminium oxides that are binding that phosphorus. So you can go for a, a lot lower target range. Whereas if you had a very high or high PBI category, that means a lot of the phosphorus you add on, add in, is going to get tied up by the soil, by these oxides. And so you will need to target a much higher target range to get the same level of pasture yield. So that's how you interpret um, these tables. So I'm interested to hear, uh, let's go with Olsen P, but if you didn't get Olsen P, if you could just type in Colwell P just to indicate that it's your Colwell P. So type that into the chat box and let's see what range um, 
what range you have. And just while people are doing that, I'll just reiterate again that your target then depends on your objectives. So what level of intensity of production system are you after? And that's the thing that then needs to be really discussed well with your advisor. So a lot of the interpretations that are done on soil test will be just assuming you want high production. Um, so that's where you need to really add in, well, what are my goals? What are my production goals? So how are we going there, Rhiannon? Uh, we have, now did you ask for the test, Kath? I was madly Googling. <laughs> Did you? Um, I just asked people to put in their Olsen P, but if it was the coal okay, P, to just mention that it is coal. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank, thanks, everyone. Um, 3.1 to 10.5, 9 to 11, 13 to 20, 11.8 to 19.3, 10, 18, uh, 3, 7. Uh, Graham, is there a Morgan test? 1.7. Oh, yeah, there is a Morgan test. Yeah. Uh, Olsen P20 in cropping a coal well of 7.2. Mm -hmm. uh, 42 coal well, target 55 because iron is 25 times higher. Mm -hmm. um, John's got an Olsen of 4. All right, so um, in amongst it, all of that, we've got a few quite low P levels, either by Olsen or by Colwell. Um, so you've got some real uh, decisions to be made here about what, what you're going to do, what your objectives are. So there's no doubt about it that at those low levels of uh, phosphorus, so Olsen's that are, you know around the three to ten mark, they're pretty low and will be um, affecting um, production. And coal wells of of seven and around that will will also be affecting your levels of production. So it really depends then on your goal um, and also what you're growing. So if you're growing native pastures and that's what you want to do and that's where you want to sit, um, then you might make the decision that you're not going to do anything. Uh, but if you are after more production um, from your pasture, then you will need to make some decisions about putting phosphorus on. So okay. also um, Catherine noted that she had 36 and then um, and then 13 after two seasons of growing hay. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good example of how quickly um, that phosphorus level can can go down, um, particularly in soils that don't have high PBIs as well. Um, so it can quickly be depleted out of the soil and hay production does take a lot out of the soil. So if your goals are for high production, then your target range will be higher. Um, my suggestion is that you target your better paddocks for investment in P. Um, so that is paddocks that have uh, generally don't have many other issues that are constraining production. So they're not your rocky steep country uh, they're, you know, ge generally um, going to perform pretty well and give you, uh, respond well to that level of P. Um, definitely monitoring phosphorus levels over time is uh, a good idea. Monitoring and managing pH because of what we've just been talking about, how uh, pH can definitely affect the amount of phosphorus that is available to nutrient to, to plants. So as the pH drops, less of the phosphorus is available. Rotationally grazing so that you get more spread, uh, even spread of the phosphorus. So that goes back to the first session that we talked about uh, what to do when you've got paddocks that have flat 
areas and hill areas and you've got some definite stock camping areas and around the stock camp areas you'll have very high P and elsewhere you'll have um, possibly some low P. So interpreting your soil test then becomes quite difficult. Um, whereas if you can rotationally graze, forcing the animals to move around all of the paddock, accessing all of the paddock, you'll get a much more even spread of phosphorus. And reducing losses. So maintaining ground cover, particularly on um, steep country, um, because phosphorus is lost from the soil not so much through leaching but through erosion processes. So phosphorus that is attached to clay um, is then can be uh, washed off the, the paddock through the action of water if you don't have adequate ground cover. So really thinking about maintaining ground cover particularly over summer is really important. Some of the questions that came through uh, for soils with um, yeah, how long does the increase in phosphorus last after super application? And I think um, that example of the hay paddock is a really good one. So if you're um, pulling a lot of phosphorus out through the action of hay or you're a high intensive production system, then your phosphorus levels will fall more quickly. Um, but soils with a higher PBI, um, then generally your soil test values will decline more slowly. Um, oh, so are there any other questions before we go on to nitrogen? Were there any other questions about um, phosphorus, Rhiannon? Yeah, yeah, there are a couple. I just have to sift through the Olsen peas. Um, uh, there's a couple of questions around uh, parts per million um, and results coming back in parts per million and uh, looking for a usable number. Uh, parts per million is the same as milligrams per kilogram. Is that right? Yes, I'm just looking. We've got that in the um, booklet. I'm just looking for where that is, the conversion of... Um, numbers sorry i'm just looking for where we've put that here we are on um, page seven uh, so parts per million is the same as milligrams per kilogram which is possibly more commonly how things are expressed on soil tests uh, so those numbers are expressing the same thing. They're just giving it a different, uh, they're just reporting it. With a in different, different units. Yeah, yeah, but it is comparable. It is comparable. So, yeah, Rachel um, and Audrey, I hope that answers part of your question. And Kylie, um, but are there some questions then around, um, sorry, I'm just going to have to mute for one second. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I've got a runny nose and <laughs> that means no leaving the house under COVID. Um, so, uh, sorry, I got lost. Uh, Audrey was asking, um, how can we interpret phosphorus results measured in parts per million instead of milligrams per kilogram? Uh, well, it's the same, um, the but same. the P-test came back at 6.5 parts per million and our lab SWEP is recommending 25 as an ideal for pasture, 70 as an ideal for market gardening. How does this compare with the milligram per kilograms and what is the best way to increase P? Um, so I think we've answered uh, that, in that it's the same, the, the units are um, comparable. Yes, I think SWEP use Olsen. It has been an issue, there has been an issue with SWEP because they don't often tell you what test they're using. Um, so it does make it really difficult for you to um, 
interpret what the result is, but I'm pretty sure it's Olsen. I, th I think it's a modified Olsen test, I think, um, also. So you would have to check whether that test is, I'm going to get this wrong, as PAC accredited. No, no. Yeah. I, I, well, if it's a modified version, then it's not a standard test. So I'm sorry, but I can't really help you with your interpretation. It's one of it is one of the issues with your laboratory selections. Um, when they don't use standard tests, then you're utterly beholden to them and their interpretation of it, which becomes difficult because you can't sort of get an independent view. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so I think, Kylie, that also relates to your question. Uh, there was a question around, um, is there no PVI associated with Olsen P from Alice? Yeah, it's an interesting question, Alice. I, I don't think the work has been done, like with Colwell, to, um, to do that level of investigation. Um, yeah, so you mostly are interpreting Colwell with PBI. One of the reasons is that with Colwell, because it's shaken for longer and you get more out, the um, considered wisdom on this is that the Colwell is therefore pulling out more of the phosphorus that uh, is on the surface that, that may be um, slightly bound and would become available during the season. So I think that's why that the Colwell P is, um, has the work's been done there with PBI, whereas the Olsen P, it's a shorter shaking time. It's mostly just reflecting what is available or the considered wisdom is that it's mostly just reflecting what is available to the plant at the time. So therefore, perhaps less um, influenced by PBI. That that would be my response there. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kath. We had another question. Um, Grant missed how to assess PBI. So um, it is in the book, but also, sorry, I keep answering the questions for you, Kath. Grant was wondering how to assess PBI. He missed that bit. Oh, okay. So some soil tests, uh, some laboratories will um, measure PBI for you. Um, so just be on the lookout for that and you can submit your soil sample and ask for PBI to be included. But once you've done it, you don't need to keep getting it done because it is a um, more of a constant for your soil. Another question regarded to related to PBI. Um, Judy has a PBI unadjusted, sixty one to one forty four. Um, APAL saying sixty one is acceptable, one forty four is high. What does unadjusted mean? Unadjusted. Hmm. Yeah, I, I would have to do, I'll have to do a little bit of uh, research on that and get back to Judy at the next session. Mm -hmm. Adjusted, I haven't come across that as yet, but I will find out. Um, and, uh, oh, so is, is super phosphate the way you add phosphorus and does super add anything other than phosphorus? So super phosphate has been the traditional way of adding phosphorus, but of course now there are um, a whole plethora of different products that are available uh, depending on your own uh, choice of how you want to add um, phosphorus. Um, what else does super have in it? Um, depending on the um, amount more refined phos uh, superphosphates, um, high analysis, what they call high analysis superphosphates, um, 
have less of some of the other things, but um, so single super will also give you some sulfur. Um, and there has been um, some issues around super also containing some heavy metals like cadmium and so on um, in small amounts. So that's the super story. Uh, but there are a range of other options and it really depends on you. It's a good conversation that you can have with your advisor um, depending on your own philosophies of what of what you want to do. Yep. Um, thanks, Kath. I think we're ready to go. OK. To salt nitrogen. Yes, um, so given the time, um, I'm just going to fly through some of these um, next lot of elements. I'll, I'll go through a bit more quickly. Um, so nitrogen is outlined on page 26 um, and that is all there for you. The main tests are testing for nitrate nitrogen, ammonium nitrogen and total nitrogen. Um, the key thing I'm going to say here is that nitrogen cycle is very dynamic. I, I hope some of you did go in and have a look at the um, animations and on the nitrogen cycle and you'll just see how dynamic and complex it is. It's all controlled by biology. So it will depend on the soil temperature, the soil moisture, all those things will then have a role to play on how much nitrogen is measured on that particular day when you come along and take your sample. So therefore, it is very difficult to interpret the results. Um, and I just, I, I guess one of the things I wanted to just point out to you is um, there's a lot of, new, lot of nitrogen coming out of um, grazing animals. So in, from a cow's point of view, uh, the nitrogen that they take in through the pasture, 26% um, of it will come out in the dung and 53% of it will come out in the urine. So there's a lot of nitrogen being put back into, the, into your paddocks through the action of your grazing um, animals and really emphasises this point of needing to rotationally graze to get that even spread because if you have animals camping um, you can just see what's going to happen to your nitrogen levels around that stock camp um, it will get very high and one of the key risks we have uh, we talked about before was nitrate leaching so this is some work that was done by um, Anna Ridley at Rutherglen Research Institute that looked at um, nitrate leaching under pasture and some of the key risk factors were around annual versus perennial so phalaris versus annual and whether you've added nitrogen in sorry or whether you don't add nitrogen in and you can see that when you add nitrogen in um, you do get much higher losses but where you have a perennial, um, if, you're not, if you're not adding any nitrogen in, where you have a perennial, um, you, you get a lot less nitrate um, leaching. So this was a, a wet year. Um, this, these two years were a bit drier. So you can sort of see that the high risk factors for nitrogen leaching are when you use high rates of nitrogen fertiliser, when you have high stocking rate intensity, um, then they're all going to be um, substantial risk factors when you for, for leaching, nitrate leaching, and that is strongly linked to then further acidification. So really getting your um, head around this is, is going to be a useful management tool for you. I don't think I'll say much here. I think I'll just keep moving on. It's all in all in your book on page 28 there. So I'll go to um, extractable potassium on page 29. Um, 
So we measure potassium. There's two main tests, a Colwell test or a Skeen test. You might see either of those on your soil test. And we also have exchangeable um, potassium because potassium also exists as exchangeable cation on the surface of the mineral. Um, and it can be exchanged um, through desorption processes, making it available to plants. Pasture and crop responses to potassium have been rare in Southeast Australia, um, particularly on clay paddock, on clay soil. So if you've got reasonable content of clay, it is unlikely that you're going to need potassium, except on hay paddocks. So where you are growing and cutting for hay, then you generally will be advised to add potassium um, there. And it is, its availability is very much controlled by soil chemistry. So it doesn't really exist in organic matter. It's very much exists in um, the minerals of the soil. And so therefore it's soil chemical processes that make that available. In terms of interpretation, um, this table's on page 30 of your booklet. And you'll see again, um, that you have an interpretation, a target that depends on what you're aiming for. So obviously if you are pushing your system and you're really wanting high production, then you will need to have a higher target level for potassium. But it also depends on your texture of the soil. So um, as you have, as I said before, if you have more clay textured soil, then it is unlikely um, that you'll need uh, to put lots of potassium on compared to sand. So within clays, with, there are certain clay minerals that have potassium incorporated in their mineral structure. So it is there in the soil and just needs some weathering processes to release it. But if you're growing hay, then that, that crop needs a lot of it and quickly. So the weathering process is a slow process. The hay growing process is a fast process. And so you're going to need some top up um, for potassium. Um, and extractable sulphur. So I'll just do this one and then we can see if there's any questions about any of those. Um, so sulphur is uh, very important for nitrogen fixation by um, clovers um, and um, other um, legume species. Um, it's also very vital for um, animal um, health. The main test that you'll see on your soil test is a um, potassium chloride 40 test. And as I said at the start, it's very similar to nitrogen in that it is very much um, controlled by soil biology. So it exists in organic matter in large amounts. So often when I'm looking at soil tests, I will see a correlation. If we're looking at a low soil carbon result, it will often, we will often see a low sulfur result as well. So those two are related. Um, and again, it's very much on, depends on how much you're pulling out as to what your target is. And this table is in the notes as well. So I might pause there and just see if there's any questions on the nitrogen, the potassium or the sulfur, Rhiannon. None specifically. At, at the moment, I've got some questions for the end. Um, okay. uh, hang on, here's one. How do you deal with high KCL 40 number 68? So that was the sulfur test. Yeah. Result 68. Yeah, so that's very high. I'd be wondering why you got that amount. Um, so it could be have something to do with sampling and whether or not you had a pile of gypsum that had been 
parked on the paddock for a little while. Um, and so gypsum is calcium sulfate and supplies um, uh, sulfur. So that, that could be an issue. I know um, it can also be an issue if you are close to some intensive uh, animal industries. So where water might be flowing from um, an intensive animal production system uh, onto a particular paddock that can also lead to a high high sulfur so it is a bit curious uh roger says it's a semi peat soil and so wondering how uh, to so it's very high it. very high organic matter yeah mm -hmm. so yeah that would be the link then just naturally high in that sulfur can you mop it up in any any way? Is there a way to manage that high number? Oh, I'll have to take that one on notice too. I don't know. Okay. I'm not used to dealing in these high numbers. <laughs> um, so SWEP has a recommendation uh, for sulphur for 11 to 15. Uh, can you think of a reason for that higher number? Right, um, so it's just above. Yeah, look, it might be um, if they're seeing that your carbon levels are lower. Um, yeah, again, it would be an interesting conversation to be had. Why, why are they suggesting that you target something higher? I, I can't answer for them, um, so I don't. I don't know. It'd be a question to ask your advisor or to go directly to SWEP. Yeah. Um, so I might just I might just yeah. finish off on this, and then we can go just finish off with questions with whatever time we've we've got okay. left. Rhiannon, would that be okay? Yeah, that's all right. So just in general then, some steps um, to produce a healthy soil. Um, I'm suggesting that you target your investment to your most productive paddocks first. Um, so the, the reason behind that is that those paddocks um, don't have a lot of issues and it might be just a small tweaking or adding a little bit more phosphorus or um, putting some lime on or something and then they'll be really um, productive. So that's why I'm saying go with them first and get that um, extra production. Then you, you've you got some income to address some of the rest of your, your paddocks. But also it gives you an opportunity to just pause and, and reflect for a minute, you know, is do you need to address every single paddock on your property, especially where you've got um, paddocks that have other issues like uh, very rocky, steep country, for example, it is going to be much harder um, to lift production on those areas. So you might want to have some time to just think that, that through. The key things that I think you should be addressing are your major nutrient issues like phosphorus. Um, as I said before, it is a key driver of production. So that, that needs to be a key focus for you if you are wanting to um, really improve production. But that's not always your goal. So just being aware of your own goal first. Um, Secondly, is really ad addressing some of those soil acidity ish issues. So correcting the pH and reducing um, aluminium by using some lime. Um, and certainly for everyone, building organic matter and biological activity. So really uh, managing grazing to keep soil covered is, is a key way of uh, en enabling that organic matter to build. And reducing traffic on wet soil. There was a question about managing waterlogged soils um, and look there's no sort of silver bullets on all of this but certainly when soil is wet it is at its most vulnerable to compaction and if you um, drive on it and put a lot of stock on it when it's wet you will compact and that just compounds 
your waterlogging situation. So the more you can do to reduce traffic, taking stock off wet paddocks, putting them elsewhere while um, it's very wet and then bringing them back in when the soil dries off um, is a key issue there. So um, I might just open up for questions then, Rhiannon, as we are now very close to finishing. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kath. Um, so uh, I had a question. I'm just going to zoom back to it. Uh, Roger had a question. He's got, um, I'm not up to, uh, two soil tests, one on a grey sand and the second on a brown sand. And he's interested in your thoughts. Uh, the grey sand had a, has a pH of 3.9, organic yep. carbon 3.6, aluminium 2.6%. The brown sand has a pH of 3.9, organic carbon, it says greater than 30, um, mm. and an aluminium of 69%. And the, the calcium is very high in the first one. Uh, I'm, not, I'm just not sure of the units. Mm, that's right. But it was high calcium in the first and lower in the second. Yeah. So, um, you know, it is, it's very hard, as I said at the start, uh, um, just interpreting off one soil test. So it'd be really interesting uh, if there were some further tests that have been done um, in previous years to see, to track how things are going there. But certainly um, with those pHs and with the 69% aluminium, um, liming is definitely going to have to be part of your um, consideration of what to do uh, because that, that's a very high level of aluminium and very low level of um, pH. So I'd be certainly suggesting lime. And when you're adding lime, uh, you're also adding calcium. So that will also help that issue as well. So certainly on that brown sand. Um, with the grey sand, the pH is still very low, but your aluminium is not as critical. Um, but it is certainly something to be watching. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Catherine's question around gypsum is around the percentage of sulphur in gypsum that's acceptable. Percentage of sulphur in gypsum. I don't know if it... Uh, yeah, look, I'm sorry. I don't know these sort of numbers off the top of my head. I'll have to come back to find, to let you know percentage of sulphur in gypsum. Again, um, gypsum is a natural product. We don't have, we don't tend to see the byproduct gypsum much anymore. Um, so there will be variation in the amount of um, calcium and sulphate uh, in your in your gypsum that you're buying. So well worth um, having a look at. Is the question about what is acceptable, Rhiannon? Or? Yeah, what percentage of sulphur is acceptable in gypsum? Uh, I think I've interpreted that right, Catherine. Let me know if I haven't. Uh, Roger has suggested that around 17% um, for better gypsum is a good number. Okay, thanks, Roger. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know that number off the top of my head. Yeah. Okay. Um, John, oh, oh, then... uh, Rhiannon, and I will say this though about gypsum is that the percentage of sulphur will also, you know, depend on why you're using the gypsum. So generally, gypsum is used more um, for its ability to help you with dispersive soils, and in that case, it's the calcium that is doing the work for you. Uh, but yes, you you can also add gypsum to get a source of sulphur uh, if you have very low levels of sulphur as well. So that's just worth clarifying um, that the question about acceptable levels of sulphur that I'm presuming then you are using the gypsum for sulphur. Mm. Mm. Um, Another one on PBI, so um, APAL doesn't give Colwell P, only Olsen and Bray 2. Mm -hmm. So 
how can or why do they offer a PBI? Um, I would say that it's just to give you an indication of uh, where your soil sits in terms of how um, reactive it is with, um, with uh, phosphorus. So it's not necessarily being used in the interpretation, although they may have some data that they're using from field sites that they've done of their own, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. But it's still useful information about how um, tightly that soil is binding um, phosphorus and may then help to influence their recommendations to you on how much phosphorus you need to put on. Yep. Thanks, Kath. Um, uh, the impact, and this was with respect to rotational grazing um, and keeping the stock um, moving and or dispersing, um, dispersing manure as well, um, was the effect of native animals on pasture, kangaroos. Did they have a similar similar impact? Um, probably less less ability to rotationally graze them. Yes, yeah, so we have less ability to rotationally graze them. But it's an interesting question. I'm not exactly sure, you know, I was able to give you that um, fate of nutrients consumed by cows. I don't know that we have the same level of understanding for kangaroos, like just how nutrient rich is their manure. I don't know that answer. Yeah. But it's an interesting um, question and certainly kangaroos can have a big impact on your um, pasture production and you know they really affect things when you're trying to give pastures a rest and you've got a whole stack of kangaroos on there it's um it's a, a difficult one to manage mm. all right sorry well, I, think... I need to have... yeah we have gone over time there was one last question if you're if that's possible um yeah gentle soil aeration not deep ripping to 250 mil uh will it aid microbial action and hence raise um ph and availability of the various minerals and that will be our our last question mm, yeah interesting question um <clears throat> It depends on your soil profile as to whether it will have an impact on soil pH, but it's a good one um, to consider because often we do find that um, pH has um, considerably decreased in the topsoil, um, but not in the subsoil. And so by doing some um, pulling up or, or some light ripping, as you say, through, through that, um, you can bring up more alkaline soils or less acidic soils to mix in with that topsoil and therefore you are essentially having a liming effect. Um, the only thing I would just caution you with is just, you know, what is also down in that 25 mil depth of soil. And this is particularly to do with soils that are dispersive which is something we're going to discuss in um, session two on Thursday. So if your soil is dispersive at depth, then you would not, uh, you, you would be encouraged to not uh, consider deep ripping or even light ripping because um, you, you can end up in a, in a pretty bad state from a soil structural point of view. So that's my only word of caution. All right, um, well, I think that is it from me, Rhiannon, um, and we'll see everyone on Thursday. So on Thursday, I will talk more about cation exchange capacity. We have um, touched on it a little bit here today, but it will make more sense to, um, on Thursday when we start talking about exchangeable cations uh, as well. We'll talk a little bit about trace elements and we're gonna have a little uh, chat about um, soil types. Um, but I guess the other thing to say, Rhiannon, is that um, I'd be very happy to receive uh, more questions that have come up from today that we haven't had time to address. So 
happy to discuss more of those um, on Thursday. Great, thanks, Kath. Thank you um, again for a um, for a really thorough um, and considered presentation and um, attention to our questions. I know it's not the easiest um, format to do it, so um, thanks, Kath. Um, no and everybody else, we will send you the link to the recording um, and the survey. Um, but yeah, we'll see you again on Thursday. Um, if you can try and be in on at 9.55 and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.